I'm Father Mitch Paquin. Welcome to EWTN Live. We bring you guests from around the world. Tonight, we will be talking about the revelations of our Lord Jesus Christ to St. Faustina Kowalska. And we'll talk about these private revelations to a great saint and how they can affect and direct our lives as well. However, before we get to our topic, we want to discuss briefly us with EWTN's Director of Online Services, Mr. Jeff Hahn, about EWTN's efforts to make our content more accessible. Jeff, what do you have for us? Well, Father, we've got, uh, we got a new platform. It's called On Demand, ondemand.ewtn.com. Yes. And we launched this platform back in May. And part of the reason for that was because of the response to COVID to make our content uh, so much more available, so much more inviting. So it's a brand new platform we have. It's been launched on iOS platforms, so your Apple TVs, all your iPhones. Um, it's on your um, Amazon Fire TV. We're about to launch it on Google TV and Roku. Mm -hmm. And we have thousands of episodes of various shows. We have paid content you can buy or rent. And then we have our free content, like this show will appear on there within a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. So people will be able to tune in wherever and whenever they want to see the content. Yeah, that's, see, it's one of the uh, ways that the media in general is changing so that this becomes possible in other networks. And for us to keep up is a wonderful thing. I, I have no clue how that, how that works, but I really appreciate y'all being able to do that so that we can have EWTN anytime, anywhere, anyhow. That's right, Father. And you know what uh, gives us a lot of, sometimes uh, myself as a technical person, I can get trapped within my four walls. But when we hear responses from people, nurses who have been in the hospital and they're working and they break out their phone because they're watching EWTN as a moment of respite of, of uh, to try to catch a breather, you know, it pushes us on even more. And then sure. people who are trapped in their homes or stay in their homes, they're able to watch us as well. And that's that, that it's all about bringing the message to others. Yeah. Yeah. And this is one of the great things. So thank you for absolutely making Father. this all possible. And of course, we will be back in just a couple minutes with tonight's guests. So please stay with us. Welcome back. Uh, we are now with Susan Tassoni, who has a brand new book. It is called Jesus Speaks to Faustina and You, 365 Reflections. Susan, welcome back. Father Mitch, welcome home from uh, Chicago. Oh, Good great. old Chicago. Yeah, that sounds like it's been tough up there, but... Uh, need yes, for a lot is. of mercy, and I yes. think this is where a book like, like yours is very welcome at this time. There's, there's a lot of desire for justice in our mm -hmm. world. People really do seem to want that, they want what's right, but they don't seem to temper the justice with mercy, and this is one of the main points of what you're bringing. First of all, why did you write this book? Well, it was interesting because, as you said, what's going on, especially here in Chicago, and I get to experience it in my own neighborhood, Father, but look what's going on. There's fear, there's anxiety. We, we have COVID. What, hundreds of thousands of people have died. Uh, mm -hmm. Unprecedented unemployment. And so when I began reading the diary, I was surprised to learn that Jesus wasn't just speaking to her. He was speaking to each one of us. Mm -hmm. So it was a treasure for me to 
want to share it. So the more I entered into the diary, the more I realized that Jesus was giving us a blueprint for life. And he tells us exactly what we must do to be worthy of heaven. Um, he's very clear about directions on how to deal with the fear and anxiety, which is so prevalent today. And it was actually providential, Father. I usually don't actually plan the books. It, it's uh, it's really God God's direction. But um, last year I wrote Day by Day with St. Faustina, which was we shared on, on your show, and it's just done phenomenal. And, um, and it was Faustina in her own words, her revelations and her responses um, and her experiences of life and day-to-day -day living. And as I was doing it, I saw, of course, Jesus was speaking to her. And I thought, oh my goodness, um, we don't have Jesus's words. And if I included Jesus's words, it would have been an encyclopedia. So I realized, I thought Jesus wanted me to wait and write about him speaking to us. And it came out during this series, series time. So um, I, I couldn't, I didn't pick the timing he did. So the book focuses on the words of Jesus to Faustina. And, um, and it's really, his words are the very heart of the diary. It's real clear that the messages he gives Faustina are for all of us, each one of us. And he's instructing us toward having a deeper relationship with him. So I divided the book up liturgically, uh, as I do, uh, because the people pick it up and they want to start at a different point in time, or if they just want to read the whole book, there's a, there's a theme, um, there's a consistent pattern. And so my hope was that the reflections that were just very profound, deep, rich, um, packed with writings of the saints, uh, theologians, uh, some extraordinary people of all walks of life that will share with us on how to help us respond to God's call to become the one he's called us to be. And basically, that's what holiness is, Father. It's simply doing God's will and being just what God wants us to be. One of the things that a lot of folks may not quite understand about St. Faustina's diary is that it's not, well, I had a date today or... I graduated from high school and I went to the prom. And No, it's not <laughs> like that at all. It's very much her talking about her, her own spiritual life. There's a good deal about uh, her development, especially in the early years. But then as our Lord speaks to her, there are also something what we might call these prophetic words. They're not the Bible. We don't treat them as if they're the scriptures. We don't look at them as if it's divine revelation that must be believed. It's private revelation. But it's very much along the lines of our Lord speaking in something of a prophetic way to address her and her times but it also, as you point out, it fits our times. He's, he's speaking to a modern situation. And uh, I, I think that it's important the way you organize not her personal reflections, but just the words that Jesus spoke to her, the words she heard in these private revelations. And you make those into bite-sized chunks for a daily consumption, sort of a daily diet, and organize that to nourish our liturgical year and our spiritual life with these words from Christ. Does that fit what you've tried to do? It's well said. You know, I was just thinking for a minute, if you don't mind me backtracking, you have so many new viewers, Father, um, that I just, maybe I should just say a little bit about her. Who is she? Um, yeah. Well, yeah. she was known for her her deep um, uh, and unquestioning faith and trust in God. And she was called the Apostle of Mercy. So our Lord, and so our Lord asked her to proclaim <coughs> his message of mercy to the whole world. So she devoted her life, her sacrifice, her suffering, her obedience, and her good works for the needy. And then we have Divine Mercy Sunday, which is celebrated worldwide on the second Sunday of Easter. And the chaplet was given us, and that's prayed by countless people daily around the world. Mm -hmm. So the essence of divine mercy is to totally trust 
in God's mercy and to show mercy to others by acting as a vessel of God's mercy. And I, and if you don't mind me adding this too, I just think it's quite interesting because today is what? The Feast of uh, the Holy Rosary, October 7th. And she died on October 5th and she was buried on the Feast of the Holy Rosary on October 7th. So I think she might be sitting in the audience invisible uh, to us, but she's, uh, she's with us. So yes, um, that's exactly uh, it. The, the, the other thing too, Father, is this divine mercy message was really, I think, ahead of her times because it was uh, it applies to us more now than ever, as you said. Mm -hmm. Jesus wants to remind us of his mercy and love. And he told Faustina that his greatest attributes are mercy and love and to contemplate these attributes. And so how do you translate that? Be merciful to yourselves and to others. Exercise mercy. Forgive yourself and others. Share disagreements without becoming disagreeable and turn to divine mercy for advice and comfort. And I and I want to share, a, I, th I don't know if you've, you know, you've read so many books. I, I found this great story, uh, Father Mitch, as a reflection about mercy. And um, the, his past, the passage that we, that we used was him dying on the cross and he wasn't thinking of himself. He was thinking of us and he was mm -hmm. praying for us poor sinners uh, to the Father. Mm -hmm. And this is the reflection um, that we we uh, added. And another thing you also mentioned too is um, what I wanted to do this time is include more scripture that back up his words as well. So our reflection had to do with Napoleon um, and he was sentencing a man to death and the man's mother pleaded for her son's life. And Napoleon insisted that the crimes that he committed demanded life in justice. And the mother, of course, was sobbing. And um, she said, I don't seek justice, um, but mercy. And he said to her, he's undeserving of mercy. And she argued, sir, if, it, if he deserved it, it wouldn't be mercy. So with that, Napoleon's heart opened and he said, I will have mercy. So you want God's mercy, then show mercy. Whenever we can be merciful to someone, we ought to show that person the same mercy that we desire at the moment of our death. And then we added one little more um, incident where there was a woman dying on her deathbed and they asked her, are you going to receive your reward? And with tears filling her eyes, she said, no, I'm going to plead for mercy. And it reminded me, Father, if, Father uh, Mitch, Father Groeschel, if you recall on many of his shows, he would talk about how he was up in years and that he'll be standing before God. And the first thing he's going to do is what? Ask for mercy. Yeah, yeah. I think there is another element that uh, about the timing of our Lord giving these revelations to St. Faustina. You know, in the 1920s, and 30s. She died in 19, October of 1938, just 11 months before the German Wehrmacht invaded Poland, her home country, where she died and had lived. And in the 1920s, Poland had been invaded from the other side by the Bolsheviks. And as this was developing, both the National Socialists, the Nazis, and the Bolsheviks were on campaigns of utter control and total mercilessness. And this message that she gave was coming to a merciless world. We cannot appreciate this today. Sometimes mm -hmm. people say, oh, with these riots that are going on in Chicago and Seattle, I think it's the end times. And I said, mm -hmm. these are not so bad as what we went through in the world in the 1920s and 30s with the wars and the communists. Uh, we cannot emphasize this point. Um, you know, by this, by the time she died, 
Stalin and Lenin had killed, had executed more Russians than Hitler ever would. Mm. And then they kept on going. They, 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 they far exceeded him. He was just getting started. And it's to this merciless culture that rejected God. The Nazis hated Christianity. The communists hated Christianity, tried to wipe it out. And it ended uh, that rejection is part of their own mercilessness. Mm -hmm. This is the world in which she was told by Jesus to speak mercy. And as you say, today, it is just as relevant as it was then. Absolutely. Well said. Absolutely, Father. Um, what surprised me most going through this um, this book was uh, the the messages. There were three messages that surfaced oh, really prominently. And guess what it was? His love for us his, and his mercy. Um, and she, uh, I, there, I have to share this, and I think you'll enjoy this passage. She said, look into the abyss of my mercy and give praise and glory to th this mercy of mine. And I'm just going to read it here. Um, uh, this is our this is our reflection. And uh, there really is an abyss here on Earth. It's part of the ocean and is usually called the abyssal zone. It ranges from 9,300 to 19,700 feet below the surface, and no one has ever explored its depths. Since the word abyss means bottomless, it's a good name for that area. Abyss is also good for God's, a good name, a good word for God's mercy, since it too is bottomless. And we have to remember that the next time you're fearful that your sins might be too great to be forgiven, no one has yet reached the bottom of God's mercy and you're not going to be the first. So he talks about this mercy and how we're to give it. He talks about very prominently, and I, I remember Mother Angelica saying this in one of her shows, that if people knew that they were loved, we wouldn't be in this situation. If people really believed how much God loved them, we wouldn't have such violence. And so um, here is what, uh, there was a conversation between Faustina and Jesus, and uh, after Holy Communion, Faustina said, I thought about you so many times last night. She said this to Jesus, and Jesus answered her, and I thought about you before I called you into being. And she said, Jesus, what were you thinking about? And he said, you admitting you into my eternal happiness. And when she heard that, she was just flooded with the love of God. And she said, I couldn't stop marveling at how much God loves us. Because, you know, Father, God doesn't need us, as you know. He's yeah. self-sufficient. Uh, he, we're made in his image and likeness. So we're really a spark of his love. We're a spark of him. We're a spark of his fire. Um, and he really can't live without us, from what it seems. He never had to create us. There were billions of human beings that he could have created. But he created you, Father Mitch. He created all the viewers. He created us in this world. Now, they might have been holier. They might have been smarter. They might have been more interesting, but he didn't create them. They were there was something about you. I think it was your cowboy boots. I'm not sure. I don't know. Probably you have the mind of twelve professors, Father. I think it's your professorship. Um, there was something about you that attracted to him, uh, and that drew him to you. And so I love what Catherine of Siena said in her dialogues. She said, "You absolutely do not need us, but you act as if you can't get along without us." Yeah. He loves us more than anybody else. And he loves us more than anybody can. And he thinks about us day and night, waiting to admit us into paradise. Um, also, there was another uh, uh, passage that he said to Faustina. He said, you are my heart. Speak to sinners about my mercy. And he repeatedly told Faustina that in addition to trusting in God, you have to exercise mercy towards one's neighbor. And so she said, Faustina said to her friend, Sister Damiana, she said, I have heard the Lord Jesus say that on the day of judgment, he will be judging the world only in terms of mercy because God is all mercy and acting out of mercy or neglecting mercy, a person determines their own 
judgment. It, it's it, it's something that I think any one of us needs to reflect on our motives to not seek God's mercy. I think sometimes there's a false humility. Well, I'm so small, I'm nothing God couldn't possibly care. There's also a real pride and arrogance uh, that said, I don't need his mercy, I don't want it. I'm not, what I do isn't wrong. And there are people all in between those ends of the spectrum uh, combining various kinds of humility and arrogance. And the mercy of God breaks through that as well. That, again, there's no sin that we can commit that is going to be more powerful than the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Mm -hmm. And this is key to St. Faustina's, Faustina's message. The, uh, I, I have a passage uh, on that, but I'll have to find it because it, it, it's absolutely beautiful. But you talked about we have a mission. You know, we, we were put here for a specific mission. Um, does he, and Faustina was. Do, do, do we have a mission like she does? Of course we do. Um, and I think that we uh, have to know, and I'm going to read this and from my uh, from our reflections, why are you afraid to begin your mission, which I've commanded you to carry out? We all have a specific mission and purpose that was given to us at our creation. You are the only one in the world that can fulfill it. No one else has your mission. As you were talking about, you know, well, what, uh, what do I, how can I be, have an impact? But you do have an impact because we just didn't happen to be, Father. Um, we have a place in God's kingdom to occupy and a work to accomplish. And you're an important part of God's great plan and integral part of history. And I love what Pope Benedict uh, uh, the 16th said. He's one of my, I love his writings. He said, each of us is a result of a thought of God. Each of us is willed. Each of us is loved. Each of us is necessary. There were billions of possibilities of human beings that God could have chosen, but he created you. And there was something about you that he wanted you to be to fulfill this mission. And what is this mission? Well, first of all, you know, how do we, how do we, know, what, how do we know what our mission is? It's through prayer. You know, prayer is, yeah. you know, guides us. Um, I, I, prayer is like the foundation of everything. Every book I've read on saints, it's their prayer. Mother Angelica, what did she do? And you said last, uh, the last show we did, Father, that for every uh, hour she did uh, television, she did an extra hour of adoration. Yep. Um, so we're, we're called to be, we're called to be holy, which is, being what God chooses us to be, we're the best we could be. We're called to be saints. She said, I like what Mother Angelica said, don't miss the opportunity uh, to become a saint. And so I included something about that in one of our passages um, because he told Faustina, you are that saint. And he's talking to us, we are that saint. And we're given the grace to, it, it, and he made us to become that. And we've got a mission to reach. So um, this is what we wrote. We're called to be saints. We say impossible. Uh, reading the lives of the saints, we think, I can't do that. We're overwhelmed at the thought of imitating holiness. Um, you can ask, how can I live like St. Francis? How can we, I live the poverty of him? Or sacrifice my life like Maximilian Kolbe? And I have to just insert this because I, my first trip to Italy, I did the, all the shrines of the great saints, St. Saint Anthony of Padua, St. Mm -hmm. Francis, St. Clair. And I was going from one to the other, and then we ended up in Assisi. And by the time I got to Assisi, Father, I, I felt I was a wreck. I went right to see a priest, and I said to him, I can't be them. It just not, I don't know what to do. And he said, you're not called to be a Francis or a Maximilian Colby. You're called to be a Susan. You're called to be a Father Mitch. So that's the good news. We don't ever have to be someone else. And if you ever notice, when, you're, when you, you are yourself, People love who you are. So he, he, he doesn't want that. Um, sanctity really is the life of grace in your own skin. So we have to really um, strive for holiness in our own circumstances, in our day in and day out activities, one day at a time. And so um, he said to Faustina, you are that saint. And I went on and, and shared this, that 
we each day we've got spiritual homework. We're enrolled in the school of sanctity. And as Mother Angelica said, when most men work for degrees after their names, we work for one before our names, ST. It's a much more difficult degree to attain. It takes a lifetime. You don't get your diploma until you're dead. Now, I know you have a lot of degrees, Father Mitch, um, but this one's going to be the top. I know. I know. That's, that's <laughs> when you finally get your Mickey Mouse ears. <laughs> it's, I, 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 what part of the importance of this is in this time of COVID, uh, yet another problem besides the social unrest that we have, we have this COVID problem. And a lot of people are stuck at home. They, especially in the urban areas where you're oftentimes stuck in apartment buildings and you, you can't get out and it, it's not easy. Especially that, during riots and protests. Riots and protests endangering you. That, I mean, you just went through that. And one of I the- I can't leave the house most of the time, Father. COVID was one thing. On top of that, it's, uh, you know, I feel like I'm in purgatory. Yeah. Well, the, the, but see, that is a benefit. Some people feel as if they're in hell mm -hmm. and that there's no hope for them. And as a result, they are committing suicide and yes. taking drugs and getting drunk. They're trying to check out. And so they, they feel that, that, that that's the difference between hell and purgatory. Purgatory has hope. It has surety that you're going to be saved. Pain, yes, but surety and purpose. People in purgatory understand they're being purified for sanctity. Mm -hmm. Whereas the ones in hell have no hope that they're going to grow in holiness. And some people are in hell because they don't even know that holiness is possible, real, or for them, and they see no purpose in life. And this is key to the kind of reflections you're offering. Sure, we suffer. St. Faustina suffered quite a bit, but... And many people suffer through life. Life is hard. It's hard. Um, but <coughs> if, you <ha> <coughs> if you have a clear sense of what God is doing in the midst of these difficulties, then you've got a better chance to be able to see hope and purpose even in the loneliness and the suffering. Father, excellent, because Jesus does have advice. He still speaks to us during COVID-19. Um, there are times, these are the times we're on pins and needles. Uh, as you said, many are feeling discouraged. Many have committed suicide. Yeah. And he, he does, these are, I want to share with you some of the things that he said about this, about okay. these well, times. I'll tell you what, we need to take a break right now. Let's keep that as a thought, and we'll go on and talk about it when we come back from the break. So I ask you all to please stay with us. Right. Now, I just want to let you know that if you'd like more information about Susan Tassoni and her many books, you can go to SusanTassoni.com. And Tassoni is T-A-S-S-O-N-E. 
SusanTassoni.com. And you can find out a lot more about it. Now, you were about to give us some examples. Go ahead. Yeah, Jesus, you know, you know, Jesus still speaks to us during COVID. You know, these are times that we're on pins and needles. Many are feeling discouraged. Does Jesus have any advice? And he did. Uh, and here are some of these great, great, uh, great advice from our Lord. He says, when boredom and discouragement beat against your heart, run away and run into my heart. Uh, so run into his heart. So this is what our reflection was. Idle souls are easy prey for demons. Struggling with boredom, uh, we're led into discouragement. Discouragement is the devil's tool for wreaking havoc. And there's this old legend, and Father, you may have heard this legend before. It goes like this. Once upon a time, the devil had a garage sale. Selling his tools, he marked each with a high price. Hatred, envy, lust, deceit, lying, pride. And he set apart from these, these um, uh, tools, there was a rather harmless looking, but well-worn tool, which was marked much higher than the rest. And it was marked not for sale. And a shopper asked, what is that tool? Why isn't it for sale? And well, Satan whispered, I can't afford to sell it. That's my chief tool, discouragement. I can pry open a heart with it. And once I'm there, I can do anything I want. So while discouragement can paralyze us, we can overcome it with confidence in God. And don't ignore the suffering when we practice charity, when we get out of ourselves, when we enter into the immense heart of, of God's love and sacrifice, no matter how small it evicts the enemy. So um, that's one point. He said another. Uh, well, um, wait, don't, don't go off from that point yet. I, I think okay. that needs to be highlighted because people do feel discouraged. I, I think you know, there's a, a sense that a culture that has been built up over the past two, three hundred years is itself under attack with its Christian foundations and the experiences people have of their own contribution to culture. And so there's a lot of discouragement as they see mm -hmm. things being torn down. You see your neighborhood being trashed and burned and torn down. And to have discouragement is, you know, very understandable. But this is also the devil's tool. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have to remember. I should not go ahead and use that. Accept, don't accept that. Uh, as being from God, this is from his enemy. Mm -hmm. Here's another that he said. Um, he said, uh, hey, well, actually, um, I just want to, it's one of my favorites. I just, it's part of it. Um, there's been a lot of tears. You know, Father, I, I you know, I, I sit here in tears when you hear of uh, the doctors and nurses or over a thousand doctors and nurses that have died. Uh, one doctor in New York, a Dr. Bream, committed suicide because she was overwhelmed by the people that were coming in and they couldn't even take care of them. They were dying as they were coming in. And, and yeah. she was uh, she was discouraged. So there were the tears of, you know, I, I, there's tears all over the all over the world. And yeah. so I, I wanted to try to address that. And in, in of course, in the diary, um, there were uh, Faustina cried for all kinds of things for for happiness out of joy. But uh, she she actually burst into tears because she didn't know how to express herself about how she felt, you know, in terms of God's God's love. And so um, he said to her, he said, uh, he said, she said, I, I, I was at a loss for words and burst into tears um, in, in my helplessness. And Jesus said, for you, I am mercy itself. Therefore, I ask you to offer me your misery and this helplessness of yours, meaning your tears as well. And in this way, you will delight my heart, delight my heart. And so this is what, what we found, Father, that I, 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 I think, yeah, I hope you'll find this interesting. Scientists have looked at tears under extreme magnification, mm -hmm. and they learned that depending on the emotion that causes the tears, they have very different appearances. Mm -hmm. And I saw this, you know, I saw it online. 
So tears of grief and sorrow look like shards of broken glass. And tears of joy and happiness look like beautiful landscape. And if we have tears from peeling onions, it looks like pressed ferns. So when we, like Faustina, cry to Jesus, um, we're crying the very essence of our tears. When we cry from helplessness, despair, he responds with mercy because we've entrusted to him our deepest essence. And in doing so, he said, it delights him. So no tear is ever wasted. He collects all our tears in heaven and will return. he'll turn all of them into joy. And he knows us even to the kind of tears that we shed. Yeah. I, th that I think that that's a, a very profound point. I, that, that connection between, I've, I've heard the same thing about tears and that they contain different chemicals as well, that uh, depending on if they're joy, joyful tears, mm -hmm. tears from laughter are different yet again, and tears of despair and tears of grief, they all have different effects and different uh, makeup. But what's interesting, too, I think, is the point you made um, of joining our suffering with Christ. And this is where mass comes in. Even if we cannot physically be in a church, some, some places you just can't. Uh, they mm. don't allow it or allow very few people but you can still participate through the media. And the offertory of Mass is precisely when you take your suffering and you mm -hmm. offer that up. That is your gift. You join it with the bread and the wine as your human gift and let Jesus transform it, transubstantiate it, just as he does the bread and the wine that become his body and blood, he also unites our suffering with his, and then our suffering gets like, it's, I don't know if you know cars much, but it's, it's like giving a car a big old shot of nitro, and that it just is fueled away. And this is something that, uh, but it's an infinite nitro, and it has way more effect for the good of others when we offer our suffering to Christ to unite with his saving death. Mm -hmm. And mass mm -hmm. is the time, whether we're present or whether we're watching on the media. Well, absolutely. You know, she, she said that it was the Eucharist that gave her strength. And if it wasn't for that, she wouldn't be able to survive. She called it the bread of the strong. Um, like Wheaties, you know, the bread of the strong. Um, here's another one, Father. Bear, Jesus said, bear with yourself with great patience. Um, and this was the reflection. Faustina remarked that the Lord gave her an occasion to practice patience through a particular person with whom she had to carry out a certain, out a certain task. And she said that she was slower than anyone she had ever seen. Um, so she had to arm herself with great patience to listen to her tedious talk. Um, so are we patient? God's patient patience is greater than ours. When, um, the, when Nineveh's destruction was at hand, Father, he provided time for repentance, and the Ninevites would have perished if God had a short fuse. Uh, so St. Faustina said that the greatest power is hidden in patience, and she said that patience always leads uh, to victory. Um, so perhaps the hardest kind of patience is to be patient with oneself when we're physically ill. And for Faustina, that was her whole life. It was her school of patience. Um, so sometimes with, with that, we can succumb to frustration. But patience is, is overcome. Uh, it, I mean, in terms of patience and overcoming spiritual trials, harder still. But it was a consolation for Faustina to learn that before every major grace, her soul went under a test of patience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I certainly have been hearing from a number of listeners on radio and viewers on TV that their patience is being tested. It's mm -hmm. hard because there's a, a, sometimes a tedium to staying cooped up 
and not knowing what to do. And this is where, yeah, it, that, that's, that is the case. It's not easy. Um, many of us have yards, backyards we can go into. Some do not. But I think to see that in the midst of the tedium that makes us impatient and the frustrations that we have, we can still use this prayer. And that's why this is kind of a, a really nice book. You give a day by day, 365 days. To, do you have a leap year passage? Yes. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. This, you know, this is leap year. So we, you know, we, we have these daily passages. And that means it's bite-sized chunks for people to bring to the prayer. It's not as if you have this whole big diary of St. Faustina. You've got some bite-sized chunks to, to take away and be able to use. And that's very helpful. I, I really made it a point, Father, to, to seek out um, help from exorcists, theologians, and scripture scholars. I really didn't want to just write anything lighthearted. So that's why I include scripture. I include the writings of theologians, of, you know, um, Mark Twain, Shakespeare, because they, you know, are also telling us how they responded to God's call. You know, another real uh, thing that has been very popular and a lot of causing a lot of traction, Father, is spiritual warfare. Uh, and Jesus gave her directives about spiritual warfare. Would you want to cover that? Yeah, please, please. Uh, we still really, have a few it's, minutes. It's, okay, um, this is a biggie. Um, it's uh, it's uh, he says a couple. These are a couple of things that are really powerful, Father. Um, don't examine with curiosity the roads which down I lead I lead you. Um, and throughout life, there's bumps in the roads. There's you, we navigate. You know, we get through one thing. There might be a bump or a, a, a curve somewhere else. Um, but again, I I quote um, uh, I, I quote Mother Angelica. Even though faith is one foot on the ground and one foot in the air and a queasy feeling in the stomach, God wants to put. Uh, wants us to put our hand in his with total trust. He said, the soul consumed with curiosity seeks knowledge to gain control over the future, to manipulate and dominate. The contemplative of soul trusts God each step of the way. And I, I quote uh, uh, Psalm 23, though the valley, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and I say, I will fear no evil for you're, for you're with me. So don't examine with curiosity the roads he leads you. Here's a powerful one. Shun murmurs like the plague. That's what our Lord is saying. So murmuring, I did research a little more, again, more depth. Murmuring reveals a lack of faith, Father. We can see it in the story of the Israelites. Repeatedly, God intervened mm -hmm. for them. Uh, their journey out of Egypt, out of slavery, the angel of death passing over their homes, the parting of the Red Sea. Um, and these miraculous works really should have transformed them. Yet the Israelites mastered the art of murmuring and they showed their faithlessness with the worship of what? The golden calf. So when they murmured against Moses and Aaron, Moses said to Israel, your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. Murmuring steals the joy out of our hearts and it leaves us with spiritual disease of an ungrateful spirit. So the remedy is a spirit of joy and thanksgiving and again, I quote St. Paul, rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in all circumstances, and for, for the will of God, for, the, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So don't be, too, don't be overly curious, don't murmur, uh, we've got, um, don't pour uh, the, out your feelings. Yeah, uh, one yes. of the things that I, I, I see as a temptation for many faithful Catholics is that they see that there are some Catholics who are not taking their faith seriously. They see sometimes clergy and hierarchy who are not taking the faith seriously. And they, they do that. They, they complain. They murmur. How can they do it? And that is St. Faustina gives us a warning. Flee that and focus on our Savior himself, not on what these other people are doing wrong or their failures to do good. Focus on Jesus so that you don't join him. He, he says, and I, I won't read it, 
we could fill in the blanks. Don't be a busybody. Focus on your affairs that have to do with me, that I give you. Um, he really has something. He really wants us to know a couple of things. Jesus, uh, geez, I think I'm talking to Jesus, to Father Mitch, Father Mitch, a couple of things. He wants to know, oh God, that he loves us. He created us. He suffered for us. He died for us. And we're his beloved. So don't be afraid. We have a mission to fulfill. And this is what he says. Do my will. That's the secret to sanctity, is doing God's will in the present moment. Whose words were those? Mother Angelica as well. Go to confession. Father, that was huge. Go to confession. He calls it the tribunal of mercy. He calls it the miracle of miracles. He said it offends him when we delay going to confession. Convert. Pray the chaplet. The chaplet is huge, Father. He repeats over and over again. In fact, there was one of my, I didn't discover this in five years that I was working on this book, Father. It was chapter, uh, passage 929. And Faustina said, can I talk to you? And he said, sure. And she complained about just what it is today. Nobody loves you. Everybody, uh, you know, is, is faithless. They don't care about the world. They treat each other, you know, terribly. It, literally going on and on and on. Really upset. And she goes, even though you appear to me, I it still gnaws at me that nobody is, you know, living out what the gift and the mission that we're given. And it just distressed her terribly. And he listened with patience and kindness. And to my, I was surprised. You know what he said to her? What's that? Pray the chaplet. Yeah. Pray the chaplet yeah. for all mankind. Pray. That's how powerful the chaplet is, especially for the dying. In fact, we added in this book the different kinds of needs that he says to pray the chaplet for. And the biggest need, Father, is for the dying. He said, pray this chaplet for the dying because the souls are in despair. And this, this alleviates the despair and gives them peace. Anybody that hears that chaplet, he comes to you as a savior, not as a judge. So we're, you know, millions, hundreds of thousands of people have died, Father. And, you know, adopt a nursing home, uh, adopt a, a church, adopt a, a, a hospital and pray the chaplet for those that are dying. You know, during uh, during the lockdown, I think there was like a thousand people dying every couple minutes. It was overwhelming. So I just upped my game on praying the chaplet. Um, that's something extraordinarily powerful that he stresses over and over again. So those are some of the things um, that he said uh, he said to do. Um, he said also, um, of course, he says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And then this is my reflection. In the darkness, Christ shines a light. Plato said, we can easily forgive a child who is afraid of the dark. The real tragedy of life is when men are afraid of the light. We're daily faced with a choice. We can feed our fears or nourish our faith. Tired of letting fear win? Stop feeding your fear. Feed your faith and your fears will starve to death. Yeah. yeah. And this is something that uh, in this culture, which I've already mentioned, is a merciless culture that needs mercy. There's also this other sense of trying to shove God out of the public forum, out of our... And we cannot allow God to be absent in our daily life. We need reminders of his presence. That's why Mother Angelica talks about Catholic art, icons and statues and such as holy reminders. We have uh, folks who've been attacking statues and churches and desecrating and all trying to get us away from the symbols of faith. And we need to all the more come to that faith as the antidote to our despair, our need for, for love and mercy. All of this has to be going on. Exactly. And Father, where does that begin? Where do you start that? With the family. Does Jesus have anything to say about families? Does he, has a, does he have a message for families? He did. There's two of them that I'll, I'll share. Um, uh, he said to Faustina, um, I want you to stay home. And when I was finishing the, the book, I w it was in the middle of lockdown and I got I chuckled because everybody was home. Yeah. Um, so what is it? Our, 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 our schedules are packed. Families don't have time uh, to have dinner together. I think that's different now. But um, I like the Irish uh, priest, Venerable Patrick uh, Payton, said, 
the family that prays together stays together. And he encouraged people to pray the daily rosary because we're reminded that prayer binds the family together. Um, scripture says that a threefold cord is not easily broken. Um, so it's paramount for spouses to pray together with their children because it creates a spiritual bond in their marriage and the family. And again, I'm quoting one of my favorites, uh, Pope Benedict. He said, the family is the little church because it transmits God. It transmits the love of Christ by the power of the sacrament of matrimony. Make the little church of your home a place of love and prayer. And one other thing uh, he talked about in terms of family, Faustina was visiting the family. She was enjoying the nieces and the nephews and and uh, and she felt guilty about it. Um, and so when she got back to the chapel, got back to her convent, she went back and, and told our Lord, I'm really sorry I didn't pay enough attention to you. And he said, I'm very pleased that you've had not been talking with me, um, but we're making the goodness known to souls and rousing them to love me. So families are the foundation of our church. Yeah. Well, this and this is where we can take time. And if you have small children, you do short amounts of time, but you do them more often. But you do those times of prayer together. And uh, this, again, is another little book to give a short reflection that can help people during the day, uh, whether they're alone or with their families. So, again, uh, Susan... We very much appreciate that you, you know, make these books that help us with daily devotions. You've done a number of them, Praying for the Souls of Purgatory, these on Faustina. So this is a great, great uh, gift to us. Let me just let people know again, the title of this new book is Jesus Speaks to Faustina and You. 365 Reflections by Susan Tassoni. You can get this at EWTNRC.com, and it is item number 1015. Susan, I want to thank you for being with us, even though it's long distance from Chicago. Yes. And may the Lord bless you and bless all of our viewers. Thank you, Father. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Amen. No, I thank you, Susan, but I want to thank all of our viewers who have been so generous in these COVID times to keep us on the air. We thank you and may we be of service to you.